I want to talk some about Startup Nation, the story that we tried to tell in the book about what made one country innovative, how we became the largest uh, essentially startup ecosystem outside of Silicon Valley. Um, that was really what we tried to, the question we tried to answer in the book is why did this happen in Israel? Um, so I want to talk some about that, but I also want to talk about kind of what's happened since the book came out five years ago. That was uh, a tremendous education for, for me and uh, my co-author, Dan Sinor. Um, so the story of Startup Nation was the story of overcoming adversity, of being uh, a tiny country in, uh, without resources in a bad neighborhood. Um, and as we just heard, you know, there's some similarities, some differences uh, between Israel and Norway, uh, but that's actually what I'm finding all around the world is um, there's similarities and differences between uh, the Israeli story and, and other countries. But what, what's interesting is and I'll skip actually skip ahead to the, the surprise. The surprise for us, you know, when the book came out, we hoped it would be it would do well in the US where it was published and we we're happy that it was a bestseller there. And you know, I thought that I would be speaking for a couple months and that would be the end of it. Um, and then when ha something happened that, that really surprised me and Dan that we d didn't dream of, didn't expect, and that is that the book started getting translated. You know, first in, in, in Bulgarian and Chinese and Turkish, and uh, I got my first email from Mongolia saying, we, you know, we, we, we really want to translate this book. We think, you know, Mongolia should be a, a startup nation. And, you know, on and on and on. It's out in about 27 languages now and still more coming out. And we realized, and then the other thing that happened is I started traveling around the world, kind of following the book around the world. And I started seeing startups everywhere. And what I realized is that, is that what we wrote about, the story of Israel, was just really the beginning of the story. That what happened is you had, you know, in terms of startup e e ecosystems, you had Silicon Valley getting off the ground some 50, 60 years ago, you know, really deep, mature ecosystem, still the largest, most important in the world. And then about, you know, 20, 25 years ago, you had Israel starting to come online in terms of startup nation. And Israel becoming the, the largest uh, and, and now most mature ecosystem outside of Silicon Valley. But then in the last five years, you have, you know, basically countries all over the world producing startups and going through this process of building an ecosystem. And it's become a global game. And that's what, what's happening with this book getting translated all over the place, is that the whole world of innovation, the geography of innovation, has been changing very rapidly. And what's interesting is that while you know, Israel has got its story, and this is really what I learned, is that every country is basically doing its own story based on its own strengths, its own history, its own culture. So, I'm going to say something about the Israeli story, but I know, I know it's not the Norwegian story, but there's some overlap, and every country has its own story, and that's what I want to get into later. So for our story, it's again about overcoming adversity. And we did this basically with three things. First is that the whole country is a startup, and to understand what that means, I have to say something about the, the nature of innovation, a mistake that we have about innovation. We think that innovation is about ideas. And you can see this because if you put the word innovation into Google Images, you do a search for pictures of innovation, you'll get lots of pictures of light bulbs. The light bulb, the light bulb is the symbol of innovation. Uh, so we think this shows that we, we think that innovation is about ideas. But it's really not, because I don't, I think ideas are pretty well distributed around the world, pretty evenly. You know, we've got a lot of good ideas in Israel, we've got a lot of good ideas everywhere. 
The question is, what does it take to transform an idea into an innovation, into a startup, into a company? And basically what it takes is two additional ingredients. You need to have a lot of drive and determination, and you also need to have a willingness to take risk. And so, in a way, the question of Startup Nation is where did Israel get a little bit more of those two ingredients? And the first one, the first factor is that Israel itself is a startup. It started with a crazy idea. You know, like any of you who are entrepreneurs know that if you have an idea for a startup and you start talking to people about it, they're going to tell you it's a lousy idea. Because all new ideas worth doing sound like crazy ideas to most people. Otherwise, someone would have done it already. So, you know, Israel started out as one of those ideas, and it took a lot of drive and determination and willingness to take risk to make it a reality, and not just 100 years ago, but continuously. And so it actually changes the way we raise our children. We, we try to raise them in a way to have a little bit more independence, to take a little bit more responsibility, to be uh, a little more resourceful, and so on. Partly because we know that that's what it took, that's what it takes to be, to exist as a country. Uh, but also because we know that when they turn 18 or 19, they're going to have to go in the army. <laughs> so if we pamper them too much, we're not doing them a, a big favor. You know, so, uh, which actually brings us to the, the next big factor we talk a lot about in the book, is the military. The fact that, you know, our boys go in for three years, girls for, for two years. Uh, uh, we have three daughters. Our oldest is 18. So she just graduated high school. She's now in this kind of gap year thing. She postponed the Army for a year. But uh, so she's in one of these kind of pre-Army study programs. Um, uh, but this fact that you're going to end up in this third experience of, of life in other words, in most countries, you have school and you have work. In Israel, you have school and the military and work. And this third period of life is very significant culturally because Israelis get things that you don't get in school and you don't get in work. Things like leadership, uh, teamwork, um, the idea of sacrifice. You know, we don't re realize how important that is. Like when you're 18 years old, you don't think that there's really anything more important than yourself in the world. <laughs> you don't really understand that there's something uh, more important you than you that actually might be worth sacrificing for. And uh, that's something we don't pick up in school. Uh, but this idea that there is something, you know, either your, your unit or your, your community or your family or the world, worth sacrificing for is actually very important for entrepreneurship because, you know, especially, especially in a country like Norway, there's easier ways to earn a living than to be an entrepreneur. And this is one of the things I see when I go to richer countries like Norway or Japan or Singapore. The big problem they have in terms of promoting entrepreneurship is success. That's the big, their big obstacle is the fact that there are easier ways to earn a living than to be an entrepreneur. And in fact, I think a lot of these people who are kind of lifestyle entrepreneurs who think it's just cool and, and, or they're going to get rich quick, those people aren't going to succeed. They're going to drop out. Because being an entrepreneur is really tough. You're going to hit obstacles. And in order to get through that, I think actually you have to care about something more than money. You have to be motivated by giving something back, by sacrificing for something larger than yourself, whether it's your community or your country or the world, something that you believe in, that you have to build, that you think it's going to make a difference. Those are the entrepreneurs that make it, that have that kind of motivation that gets them through those obstacles. So that principle of sacrifice is really important. Another thing that Israelis get is, is what I would call mission orientation. You know, the main thing they try to teach you, whatever kind of unit you're in, is what a mission is. It's something that you have to get done, you have to succeed, but you also have to take risk. And how do you balance the need for success with the need to take risk? And this is the classic problem of the entrepreneur or anybody in business. So uh, this mission orientation is very important. 
lastly, I would say for us, a big factor has been that we're a country of immigrants. Um, I came to Israel from the U.S. 20 years ago. Most people in Israel, either they themselves are immigrants or their parents or their grandparents. So, and why is that important? Because immigrants are natural entrepreneurs. They naturally have those two ingredients. They were driven enough to move from one place to another. They took a risk when they did that. So it's not surprising that entrepreneurs in many places are the immigrants. You know, if you, you meet an entrepreneur, it's probably a good guess that they are an immigrant. Sometimes they're an immigrant even within the country. Like when I was in China, you can bet that a lot of the entrepreneurs you meet are immigrants within China. They're immigrated from one province to another, and they have that immigrant mentality. Um, so that's been very important for Israel. So those are, those are like three big factors for Israel. But, you know, why is this relevant for a country like Norway or any other country? I would say that I'm going to start here kind of from the end, from my big message. And that is that we have a problem. We have a problem in Israel. We have a problem in Norway. We have a problem all over the place. And that is we tend to think we have to do all this by ourselves. Every country tries to build their own startup ecosystem. And we should not be doing this alone. This is a huge untapped opportunity, and it's particularly untapped here in Europe. I mean, you have, I mean, think about how ridiculous this situation is. You basically have startup ecosystems in every country in Europe. And you're all more or less at the same stage. I would say that there, there are kind of three stages of a startup ecosystem. The first stage is you got startups and no venture capital. Uh, startups are coming up by themselves, but nobody knows they exist inside the country or outside the country. You know, this is almost everywhere I go. You know, Korea, Brazil, you know, Colombia, Kenya, you know, rich countries, poor countries, you've got startup ecosystems, and in the country them, them, themselves, they don't know the startups are unknown. There are not really a lot of venture capital funds, and there's certainly no interest from Silicon Valley or anybody else. So that's like stage one. Stage two is you get your first high-profile success stories. Let's say like a Skype in Estonia, or uh, Angry Birds in fin Finland, you know, kind of, it tends to be like a consumer thing. Um, not all companies are high profile success stories that kind of capture people's imagination. Um, <clears throat> like when, uh, uh, when Waze, the Israeli traffic app, was sold to Google for a billion dollars, that got a, a lot of attention recently. You know, uh, a couple months earlier, uh, a startup, a cyber startup called Trustier was sold to IBM for almost as much, but nobody paid attention because, you know, cyber security is not as sexy as a consumer traffic app. You know, so, uh, but whatever it is, basically each ecosystem needs to get those first high-profile success stories. Um, uh, I'll just tell you quickly uh, one that happened in Israel that was pivotal for us. There was a company called ICQ that produced one of the first uh, uh, chat programs. Um, uh, it basically, in the, in the 90s, it went viral over the internet. It was a free chat program. And, you know, went viral before Facebook, Twitter, all these things. And it was sold to AOL for $400 million with no revenue. It had no revenue at that time. So it was a classic bubble story. So don't, don't try that at home. Um, that's not going to happen anymore. Uh, but what happened when ICQ, and it was started by a few 20-year-olds. So Israelis saw this and said, hey, if those idiots can do it, I can do it. So this was a tremendous signal within Israel. Said, yes, we should go into startups. That's something we should do. And it was a tremendous signal to the outside world. There's something going on in Israel. You better check it out. So that's, that's, those success stories are the watershed moments for each ecosystem. And then the third stage is once you've got those, 
then the ecosystem gets more mature and begins to attract more capital, more talent, and it, you have a virtuous cycle. You know, so those are the three stages. So basically, most European ecosystems are in stage one right now. They've got the startups, they don't have the venture capital, they're trying to get those first success stories. So how do we speed this up? I think the way to speed it up is for us to do it together. You know, to pool our strengths. Why, why have all these many ecosystems? Why not build stuff across ecosystems within Europe? You know, Europe may be a single market, but uh, when it comes to startups and innovation, it's certainly not. Um, and I have some concrete evidence that building startups with founders from different countries actually is an asset. Like when I was in Croatia, I met uh, a Croatian founder of a startup called Monolith that's actually based in Netherlands. And this is a startup that's got founders from Croatia, from the Netherlands, and Estonia. And, you know, the, the guy who started it has, um, it did a number of startups before, but this is his most successful startup. And he thinks it's because he's got founders from different countries. And even from those three European countries, he can say, right, the guys from Netherlands are better at this. The ones from Croatia are better at that. The ones from Estonia are better at that. So when you start combining ecosystems, you start building, combining strengths of different cultures, different places. And I think this is the faster way to get to a critical mass in Europe. And I think that the countries that do a better job of this are going to succeed faster. So like one of the things, messages to the people I was talking to here, like in charge of the innovation system, is I know Norway is spending a lot on, on promoting innovation, on trying to increase R&D spending. By the way, Israel spends 4.5% of its GDP on R&D, just civilian uh, GDP, civilian R&D. That's the highest in the world. It's, it's almost twice the European average. And, but that's not because the government's so smart. The government didn't say, oh, we're going to spend 4.5% of our GDP. The reason we're able to spend so much on R&D is because we have hundreds of, of corporate R&D centers, you know, IBM, Google, Microsoft, Apple, so on, these big R&D centers, and so many startups. Because we have all that going on, we're able to spend that much on R&D. So the way to increase all this isn't to increase R&D spending. The way you get increased R&D spending is you do more startups and do more R&D centers. It's a, it's a result, not a cause. Of, of building the ecosystem. Um, so, what I'm saying is that I think that the way that Norway can do this faster is, first of all, I already heard while I was here that you have a kind of a, there's at least one organization that's trying to promote the kind of uh, uh, Nordic ecosystem as a group, Nordic countries. Uh, and I think that's a great initiative. I think, you know, just pulling the talents of Nordic countries is not enough. That you need to also uh, build on connections with the rest of Europe. And in that, I would include Israel. For you, Israel could be a huge asset. It's the, the biggest, again, it's the biggest ecosystem outside Silicon Valley, and it's right here on your doorstep. And it has the advantage of not being Silicon Valley, of not being in the American market. Because we need to, and this is, um, this is actually important. You know, th those of us who are outside the U.S. market in Silicon Valley, particularly in innovation, we tend to think of that as a disadvantage. It's like we all have to be in Silicon Valley. That's like the mecca of innovation. And we in Israel, we feel the same way. We tend to, and Israelis are, are, are much, I think, much too oriented towards the U.S. market. We've got this beautiful highway between Israel and the U.S. market. It's great, it's important, but we're, we've, we've overdone it, okay? Uh, it turns out that the rest of the world is actually growing faster than the American market. Uh, it's, uh, it's bigger than the American market, and it's got the more interesting opportunities, I think, going forward, the bigger problems that need to be solved. 
And those of us who are outside the U.S. in Silicon Valley, we need to start thinking of that as an advantage because basically Silicon Valley is very, they have a, a we all, in fact, via Silicon Valley, have this image of what innovation is. It starts in the U.S., say, in a dorm room in Harvard, and it spreads to the U.S. market, and then it spreads to the rest of the world. That's how innovation works. That's our kind of unconscious image. And our unconscious image of what a startup is is like an app to, make a, to find a better restaurant. It's basically to solve a rich country problem. That's our image of what startups are. We need to change that. There are bigger problems to solve than finding a better restaurant. There are other problems out there than rich country problems. There are other markets out there than the U.S. market. And it's going to be harder for Americans in Silicon Valley to, to understand that rest of the world than it is for us who are outside the American market. And we should take advantage of that. Now, in Israel and Norway, we're not exactly in that rest of the world either. We're in rich countries. So we also have to branch out. We have to connect with emerging markets. And I think there's tremendous opportunities um, uh, to solve really big problems and actually do leapfrogs of technology in some of these emerging markets, combining the strengths of rich countries like Norway and Israel and a lot of tech with big problems. Uh, I'll, I'll just give a very small example uh, in Kenya. You know, Tim Cook was very proud with his iPhone 6 there saying, we have mobile payments, right? Well, I met a guy named Solomon in Kenya who with feature phone has been doing mobile payments for years with text messages on a thing called M-Pesa. He could, he could buy stuff on the street, he could get paid, he could send money to his family, all with text messages. You know, uh, he didn't need an iPhone 6. And, and basically, and so this guy Solomon in Kenya, with my iPhone in, in Israel, startup nation, all I can do is pay for parking. I can't do what he's doing in Kenya. You can't do it here either. Uh, you know, so this is an example of how in Kenya they just leapfrogged over the whole banking system, over credit cards, over mobile payments, over all these things. Because they didn't have so much infrastructure, they were able to just skip all those things and go to something that's actually better. Uh, and there are all kinds of opportunities like this for innovation if we start thinking beyond the American market and beyond the rich world market. So um, I think I'll leave it at that and uh, we'll get into a lot more during the discussion. Thank you very much.